we have a set of issues that we're looking for because we know exactly what causes wrongful convictions. We know that wrongful convictions happen when people are convicted based on types of forensic science that have been uh, debunked. We know that when people are interrogated under the circumstances like what happened to Victor, that that is you know, highly suspicious. We know that when people are identified based mostly on eyewitness identifications, that that's a real red flag. Welcome to WGBH. For those who are new to WGBH and maybe just don't know a lot about us, I'm very proud to let you know that we are the largest public media outlet in New England. On both radio and television, we reach more New Englanders than any other public media station. We're a major contributor to, to public radio, with three national programs that air on more than 400 stations across the country. And locally, we have three radio stations, two here in Boston, and one on Cape Cod. Public media is so essential these days, with fewer and fewer media outlets interested in serious journalism. And serious journalism is difficult to do. It's expensive and requires both nurturing and exposure, and few organizations can do it alone. So strategic partnerships have become crucial, and that's why three years ago, WGBH partnered with the New England Center for Investigative Reporting. And today, NECIR is based at WGBH News and works in collaboration with our reporters and editors to provide the type of investigative reporting that fewer and fewer organizations can practice. And now it's my privilege to introduce Jennifer McKim, senior reporter of the New England Center for Investigative Reporting, to introduce tonight's program. Thanks so much. It's so great to be here on Tuesday of a holiday week to see so many of you here to talk about such an important topic, which is criminal justice and wrongful convictions. So it's really great to be here. Um, just a little about us. The New England Center for Investigative Reporting is here based out of WGBH Public Radio and Boston University. Um, and we have this dual mission of writing investigative stories that make a difference in our communities and also teaching the next generation of students. Um, so, uh, just so you know, we have cards, if you would like to sign up for our bi-weekly newsletter, we have cards that are out in the lobby. We'd love you to sign them and give them to us, and we will um, include you as part of our membership. We, uh, we benefit from our readers and appreciate your support. Um, this is great to be in this group. I'm really honored and excited to have these folks here with us. Um, with this panel, which is an incredible story, uh, sort of an example of the Im import of storytelling and investigative reporting and, um, and heart and soul, I guess, and passion. So uh, first, Victor Rosario, who is, our, I would say, our guest of honor, uh, who is here. He was convicted of arson for a Lowell fire that killed eight people in 1982, including five children. His advocates questioned the evidence, and after investigative reporters, including the New England Center for Investigative Reporting and our panelist, Dick Lair, shed light on this case, a superior court judge released him in 2014. In September, prosecutors abandoned efforts to retry his case. He spent 32 years in state prison, where he became a pastor and married his wife, Beverly, who is here with us today. Where are you, Beverly? Oh, there's Beverly. Um, She just told us the story of how they met when she taught him English in state prison some five or seven years after he was uh, jailed. Um, in prison, he started a nonprofit called Remember Those in Captivity Ministries, Inc., which aims to strengthen ties between prisoners and their families. He's an advocate for the wrongfully convicted and an avid marathon runner. Um, he started running marathons in prison, or starting to run in prison, and uh, since then has run the New York City Marathon, and just heard today that he'll be running the Boston Marathon in 2018. So you can cheer him on there. Um, Dick Lair is an award-winning journalist, formerly of the Boston Globe. He's an author and a Boston University professor. He recently published a novel titled Trell, which is about a 14-year-old girl who teams up with a newspaper reporter to free her wrongly imprisoned father. 
Lisa Cavanaugh is the director of the Innocence Program, part of the Massachusetts Public Defender's Office. The office started in 2010 has had, and has had several high profile successes over the last couple months, um, which is really amazing. And I'm looking to hear more about how you do your work and how, um, how the reporters tell these stories. So we're going to start uh, with a with just, it's going to be a natural conversation. We're going to talk amongst ourselves and then we'll ask for questions. So, Victor, again, we're honored to have you here today. And um, we wanted to bring you, we wanted you to bring us back to the 1982 fire that led to your arrest and conviction. Um, you first confessed to the lighting of the fire. Uh, as we've learned over the years of wrongful convictions, false confessions have been a big problem in these types of cases. Um, can you explain a little bit, can you bring us back to that time period? My understanding is after the fire you attended, you were there at the fire and then within two days you, you were brought into the police and, and asked a bunch of questions. Can you bring us that back and, and sort of explain to, to the folks how it un ended up that you confessed? Okay, before, before I, get, I get to 1980, 82, I have to go back a little bit more back where I come from. Uh, basically, I was in New York City. From New York City, uh, I arrived to a law in Massachusetts in 1980. In a period of two years, I was uh, working in Tewsbury, uh, one of the companies in Tewsbury Mattress Company, where I was working. At the time when, the, uh, in 1982, when uh, basically when the accident happened, I call it an accident because I'm not calling it an accident. I call it just an accident. And the reason why I call that is because uh, the motors that I went to the Cato Street in 1982 was to purchase some drugs. And in the process of that, that's when the fire occurred and where the eight people died. And my motives to be there was to buy some drugs. Uh, in that time, uh, what I tried to do was to try to save the people. And even a reporter asked me that day, asked me for what had happened in my hands, then I caught one of my hands. And in that moment, what happened was that I gave my name. My name is Victor Rosario and I live in 38 Bryant Street, Bryant Street and Lowell. You were 24 years old. And I was 24 years old. And that time, I was basically uh, speaking the English language that today I can be able to just at least to convey my feelings and my thoughts in the English language. And that time, lo único que yo estaba hablando era en español y de la manera en que ustedes se sienten ahora, de hablar español, ustedes realmente están como medio confundidos porque... So he's telling us that at that point he only spoke Spanish. <laughs> eh, eh, I think they create, in that moment, everybody was confused. What he's talking about? Okay, I, at that time, I even no understanding what was going on. You had no idea what was going no, on at no the time. At all. No, no And idea the police brought you in and on. asked you a bunch of questions. Exactly, and in the process of that, uh, I remember that, 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 that when I went, I went to the police station, uh, you know, observing a fire, hearing people inside the house, children screaming. You heard the, okay, the screaming. Okay, uh, yes. You were there. That's the reason why I was trying even to go inside to the house when one of the friends, Edgardo Garcia, trying to put me out. If he let me go inside to the house, I will not be able to even to be here. I think I will be dead in that time. Doing that, you know, uh, I just confused my mind. When I came home, the only thing I was smelling, the same thing that I was smelling, okay, in, in the fire. Uh, that's the thing that happened to me. That's the thing that happened to me. Now, when I went to the, uh, to the police station, and the police station take me to uh, that moment, take me to the interrogation, what they call interrogation, everything that I learned is because I study after, after the fact. But in that time, 
you know, when they mentioned that I was confessed, I only signed a piece of paper, then I don't know what was in the piece of paper, the contents of the piece of paper. And for that reason, you know, just became to be, uh, a, found out myself in a hospital, in, the, in Bridgewater State Hospital, where I even don't recognize where, who was my mother, who was, I was completely gone at that time. Lisa, okay. you know about, you are, of course, a huge expert in this area. How often are wrongful confessions or false confessions part of this problem? I mean, what we've learned from studying DNA cases, which is kind of the, the beginning of how we understand these wrongful convictions, is that 25% of just the DNA exonerations have involved some form of either false confession or, in some instances, guilty pleas uh, that were false. <clears throat> so it's, it's an enormous problem, and it's much more widespread than I think most people can understand. Um, but it's, it's something that's really hard for people to get their head around, that idea that you could be innocent and confess to something you didn't do. Um, but what Victor described, you know, he, he, there was no recording of this interrogation. There was a series of statements written in English that were presented to him, and what the interpreter who was assisting with the uh, interrogation later uh, revealed is that he didn't even translate the last of the statements because Victor was so completely out of his mind. Um, so it's, you know, it, to, to even call it a confession um, has a certain false ring to it. And wasn't it one of those instances where the interrogation kept going on and on endlessly mm -hmm. for many, many hours? Um, you were suffering from withdrawal, mm -hmm. drug withdrawal. Um, and I think, if I remember correctly, basically if you sign this piece of paper, you'll be able to go home. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That's what they told you, mm -hmm. but you didn't go home. No, I just went to prison. I just went to prison. Uh, you know, it's 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 hard to even to uh, to even to explain because you don't have a clear memory. The only thing, the only thing that you have is what you read after the fact. The, the documents that is there, the police report, uh, everything that is in the transcripts, and then you're trying to understand. The language, the, even the, the law language, the, you know, no, no, you don't have any any uh, uh, knowledge of it, uh, and, and 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 that's what I went through, uh, trying to understand why I was doing there. I remember the, when I was in Bridgewater State Hospital, I saw in television, I saw in television, the, I saw myself in television. I even don't know the way I was. Then I saw myself in television and found out that I was accused to do this this fire, and, and for me, he said, no, this is not me. And I even, at that time, I even stopped drinking the medication that they was given to me. Then I can confront the reality. What was the reality? Why I was there? So, so when you um, then were eventually convicted for this crime, can you talk to us a little bit about what went through your head when you heard that guilty sentence? I, I just, I just feel betrayed. I just feel betrayed that the system that was, that was to protect me, it let me down. That's what I felt. I felt like a, this system is supposed to be protecting me, and now he let me down. Now I have to go to the, the prison system, okay? Going to the prison system just to face and trying to one way or another, how are I going to convince the innocent man? How are I going to convince the people, even inside the prison system? How are I going to convince them to let them know? Because everyone, they go to the prison, they say, I am innocent. But to be innocent in prison and to realize that this is the happening to a person that no knowing what's going on and everything accusing you, the only thing that I found out it was found myself to do one, two things. Or oh, I hate people, or oh, I love people. And I was myself, found myself in that position. Or oh, that I hate the system, or oh, I hate the people. They're doing this to me, or oh, I love the people. And then I decided to love the people no matter what. And in the middle of the adversity, I found out that is an equal opportunity to arise no matter where we are. And I found out that. And when I found out that, I followed that. And that's where 
today I can be able to say I'm here. Well, you are a great role model for everybody, um, especially this week. So Lisa, can you talk a little bit, um, we've uh, worked together on other uh, cases that you've worked on, and um, I know you get hundreds and hundreds of these types of petitions from people in state prisons telling you they're wrongfully convicted. Can you talk a little bit about how your organization chose to take on Victor's case and, and what it is that uh, prompts you to choose one over another? Well, the main reason that I chose to take Victor's case is actually sitting in the front row. <laughs> um, his lawyer uh, and his wife, um, Andrea Peterson, um, brought the case, uh, brought Victor, um, not a case, a person, um, to my attention, um, and actually to the woman who was the first director of the Innocence Program, Deborah Krupp. And, um, you know, as, as had several other attorneys when the, when the call first went out, the Innocence Program was created in 2010 and the call went out. You know, if, if attorneys have clients who are innocent and need help, uh, we now exist, we have funding, um, here's how we can help. And Andrea was first in line uh, because she knew she'd been working with Victor uh, and, and had been investigating his case for four years at that point and um, had already uncovered uh, a lot of really powerful evidence uh, that, that demonstrated his innocence, both um, all the problems with the, the, the interrogation and then also just the profound flaws with the arson science that was used to prove that this was a, a set fire, uh, which all turns out to be completely wrong. Um, so, you know, it, it was partly driven by the power of, of, of the person advocating for him. Um, and that's, that's, that's always an element, um, you know, and, and so there's, there's often an individual component to how cases are brought to my attention. But then beyond that, we have a set of issues that we're looking for because we know exactly what causes wrongful convictions. We know that wrongful convictions happen when people are convicted based on types of forensic science that have been uh, debunked. We know that when people are interrogated under the circumstances like what happened to Victor, that that is you know, highly suspicious. We know that when people are identified based mostly on eyewitness identifications, that that's a real red flag. So there's sort of a set of red flags that I have in my mind with every single application and Im immediately after seeing one of those issues, whether it's forensics or eyewitness identification, um, that causes me to want to look more closely. Um, you know, Victor had a, a powerful set of advocates, and I, I, I think that almost, I mean, all of our clients, um, as it turns out, are remarkable human beings who also have compelling stories. Um, although I have to say that Victor is among the most special and unusual people I've met, but. Um, <laughs> But I, I think that you know it's it's a combination of knowing what causes wrongful convictions and then also um, taking the time to really get to know the human beings behind the cases. Let me let me let me say a little bit about if it, may I about Andrea Peterson. Andrea, when I met Andrea, uh, it, it was a moment of. Andrea of, is his first his first yes, attorney this yes, year in yes. the first row. Uh, it was. It was something that, that, that I have to, because every single lawyer that I met at the beginning, it was a lawyers that really they not did anything at all. The only thing was just passing the back end, basically. Okay? Uh, when I met Andrea, it was a point where I don't want to go to parole. I, wanted, I, just, I just was tired of, of trying to convince people that I am really an innocent person. And, when I met Andrea, I, I told Andrea, even told Andrea, listen, if you not take this case, I will die in prison. If you not take this case, I will die in prison. And I say that to her, not just to, to play with her emotions, but just to let her know that I was a human being, that I was inside the prison system as an innocent man, and nobody was doing anything. And when she started working in a case, I even tell her, take the time that you need to take. Take the time that you need to take. Because I know that she was the person that really had the heart to move, okay, to move this case and to bring the case to the point that we are today. Wow. And so I just That's great. I have to say that. 
So Dick, um, how did you get involved? Tell us where this started for you and your story with um, Victor. Yeah, uh, so I'm, uh, I was, had left the Globe and was teaching journalism and where I am still teaching at BU. And um, with, another, with a colleague also from the Globe, named Mitchell Zukov, and we'd both been on the Spotlight team at the Globe. Um, my last year at the Globe, I had written, uh, done an investigation on a wrongful conviction case. Uh, the case of Sean Drumgold and the killing of young Tiffany Moore in Boston. So these, I was sensitive, I felt these were important stories. And now at BU, we had set up a, um, what we called investigative reporting clinic for, for grad students and upper level uh, undergrads. And we always wanted to have a wrongful conviction case, you know, in the mix because um, they're important stories if you can bring it to the finish line. But it, even if you can't, there are incredible learning opportunities in terms of what it takes and investigating and research. So that was sort of the general context um, in which we were, we were working. And Andrea, you're going to have to help me here because, um, you know, once we got on to Victor's case, and uh, I, and at that moment, NECIR, which was in its early, early stages, um, was setting up shop at BU. And I ended up working on this story with one, just myself and an undergraduate student who, who was clearly a rising star, and today he's at the Wall Street Journal, a young man named Jack Nickus. Um, and I don't know, what I don't remember is like how we started talking in the beginning, because we had a, a relationship with um, the New England Innocence Project where we were, they would refer non-DNA cases, because at the time the Innocence Project was exclusively DNA. Um, and the, and non-DNA cases, I mean, it's really a, <laughs> tough. Um, Bob should tell. Bob? Okay. Tell. Okay. The Committee for Reason and Justice. Okay. And he reached out to us and said, you might want to look at this. That's, that was the Committee on Reason and Justice. Okay. Set up to raise money to support people who were innocent, who had been convicted of child molesting, All right. sexual abuse cases. Okay. And I had run into him, and I was just asking everybody for help. And right. I said, you know, well, can't you take this case on and raise some money for us? Oh, no, you don't have any abused children. I said, how about five burned to death? Right. Oh, good, he said, okay. okay. <laughs> yeah. God, I hope everyone can hear that. Yeah, I know. So exactly. then I got, so I guess, so, so you emailed. So he was like a, he, a he matchmaker. Yeah, okay. He, and he had told me that he yeah. knew you. So what yeah. year was well, I don't that? Do I don't you remember what year that was when you got involved with this? When did we, uh, what, the this, it took this. It was probably in 2008. 2008, 2008 or 2009, okay. Nine. So this was your first sort of innocence case? No, I'd already done one at the Globe. But uh, here at, 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 at BU, BU. And, for, and then we ended up doing it under the auspices of NECIR. And do you remember what it was about Victor's case that sort of made you think, huh, that's the one I'm going to focus on? Well, ag ag again, it, it starts out, and, and you know, as a journalist, um, it's really important. I mean, we went and, you know, so we got, we were connected with Andrea, who was Victor's primary attorney and longstanding attorney and a saint. Um, and, <laughs> and, uh, we, you go and have a meeting, and, you, and every journalist goes into every situation, hopefully with a heavy dose of skepticism. Everybody in prison's innocent, you know, according to, you know, everybody in prison. Um, and so I listened to Andrea and, and some of the, you know, about Victor and about his case. Um, Did and you about go visit him in prison? Not right away, you know. Um, and. Um, and then, then didn't you know? Then you go back, and every journalist, you, you read the clips, you read what your way into the story, and then it's just like one step at a time. And then I enlisted. Uh, I felt like I, I really wanted to do this and really dig into this story. It looked like it had what we call legs, you know, had traction, um, and there was a lot of good issues in it. The fire science, for example, um, the you know the the confession with all the drugs and and. Uh, and, and I, this didn't come up, at his original attorney, this, so some of the stuff on its face just slapped you around and say, wait a minute, this doesn't make any sense. Victor's trial attorney, um, you know, public defender, right, um, had a drinking problem. Just um, to be clear, did not, not actually a public defender. Okay. He was appointed, but this he was, was he a worked public This was a different time. It's George Higgins' time, you know, or something. You know, if you ever read George Higgins. 
but he, you know, he had a drinking problem. And at the very time he, in Middlesex County where he's representing Victor Rosario on these unbelievable charges, he's, he, uh, as a, he was facing vehicular homicide charges <laughs> in Middlesex County for having, while dr drunk, killed somebody in a car. Two people. Two people. I mean, <laughs> how can that even get off the starting blocks? in terms of the conflicts. Well, and, and Victor had to, had to consent to proceed. Yeah, and no one that. should have allowed that. You know? How so, much time did he, did he spend with you, your, de, your, pope, your defender, your attorney? How much time? How in, much time? At in trial days? preparation yeah. or something. In preparation. I did this. He visited me a couple of times, no interpreters. Uh, mm -hmm. Just, uh, just uh, signed a piece of papers, you know? Just signed this, signed these emotions, signed that, signed this. Uh, no interpretations. Uh, when, when I met Mr. Campbell, uh, I was in a situation of, of desperate situations, hopelessness, where anyone they come to say to you, the whole world is against you. And somebody come to you and said, don't worry about it, everything's going to be fine. You started trusting that person. And because I started trusting that person, everything that he come to me, I don't know what is, I don't know the law, I don't know anything. Right. I just trusting him because he's the only one that he's in my side. Everything is around me. Is he still alive, this no. attorney? No. 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 Wow. No. So, so Dick, so how did you get from? So those are, you know, red flags, and yes. that there might be a story here. Um, a journalist. Um, <laughs> also, a, a very good thing is Andrea on the one hand was very cooperative. Journalists need that. She has the records, okay? She, it becomes very economical from my perspective as a journalist when someone will open up their files to you, um, all the documents, all the investigatory reports. Otherwise, you could spend weeks, months, who knows how long um, going through, you know, freedom of information requests and going through the official channels and whatnot. There's that cooperation on the one hand, but also, a journalist always has to stay independent, okay? You're gonna get the information, making no promises. Whatever we're gonna learn, we're hoping to test whatever she's gotten um, that could be part of the story, Andrea and her team, but also try to advance the story, um, being able to do things and uncover things and f learn new things that advances the case or in our, in our um, you know, in, in, from our perspective, a story. So that's how it got going. Um, and um, like I say, I was working with an amazing young talent in Jack Nickus, and today, together we spent, you know, I forget how many months, but it was a while um, before we, um, um, you know, we brought a story to publication that really showcased Victor. And very, I think pretty early on, we went to saw Victor at, um, we did it, we, you know, set up an a, a interview that we could tape. Was it Walpole? Norfolk. Norf Norfolk. He was a nervous wreck. <laughs> I mean, you could tell when he walked into the room. You were tightly wound. It's clear. <laughs> um, and uh, which is, uh, you know, totally understandable and all that. And um, but you know, we wanted to get that, you know, um, that sort of gut check that you have as a journalist. Uh, you need that piece of it. Um, so we did that interview and, and and went from there. I have to say, the fire signs really, you know, was was huge in terms of blowing us away. Um, the stage theory was that it, it, um, he had thrown a couple of Molotov cocktails uh, into this building, into these apartments that killed all these uh, you know, people. Uh, technology and science has, has advanced incredibly since you know, you're, that happened, that event and those killings. Um, and, uh, and, and they've been involved nationally in cases around the country. There was a great New Yorker piece out of a case out of Texas. Uh, Andrea was in touch with them. We independently um, uh, got in touch with people, someone she'd been talking to and someone else. And independently, they were reaching, this is insane, this is crazy, this is junk science. There is no evidence of Molotov cocktail fire. Um, and uh, so that was really powerful, getting, getting that, uh, you know, that input and, and that um, clarity in terms of, of where fire science has gone. And then, you know, doing the interview with, uh, with um, Harold Waterhouse, mm -hmm. who was uh, the Lowell um, uh, in, you know, fire expert at, in that era. Um, and doing, uh, you know, it's one of these memorable interviews as a journalist where you end up getting thrown out of the house. Because <laughs> um, your last question is, 
you framed Victor, didn't you? You know. <laughs> Was it really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's what you'd say for the last. <laughs> um, because he didn't want to hear anything about. It. He just knew Victor did it. Um, you know, none of this this new science. None of this. It means nothing to him. I know what I know, and I always will. I think he referred to them as pointy-headed scientists, actually. Did he? Okay. <laughs> so um, he kicked you out after that question? Yeah. I was the it was Jack, good guy, bad guy with Jack. Jack was the young guy, the good guy, and I, I played the bad guy. And we finished our interview and had him walk us through. And, and he said, this doesn't add up. I, you, know, you framed him, didn't you? Or to something to that effect. And he was up and out of his chair. And uh, that was the end of the interview. But, that's, <laughs> but we, we knew that was going to happen. But you have to ask the question. Right. Do you have any doubts? Do you have any second thoughts? No, nothing, all that. Um, and uh, you know, asking, you know, did you frame him? You, know, you never know what they're going to say. Well, and I think part of what, um, what's so uh, telling about the kind of story of how Victor's case came to light, right, from, the, from when Andrea first got involved, bringing you on board, <laughs> is, that, um, uh, is that it required looking at what happened from so many different angles. And so many different people ended up participating in, in that. The New England Innocence Project got involved, and their students were poring over documents. Um, you know, the journalists uh, who, who are looking at the case from a certain angle. Um, and in the end, I think it's really not possible to, to reveal what went wrong without having the help of all of those different people. That it's, it's sort of by looking at it from all these different angles that we can really understand what happened. So, um, it's so very humbling. Say one more thing. You know, it's really nice to be up here with Victor because uh, I, it was just a month ago when um, we had dinner. Uh, Jack Nickus was in town from California, so we all had dinner. It's the first time I've seen him, uh, you know, in the real world. Uh, uh, after <laughs> the only other times I'd seen him was in prison. So it is. Yeah. Uh, it's pretty amazing. Yeah. Pretty amazing. And he wasn't. He was very relaxed when we had dinner <laughs> a month ago, and it was nice to see. He was quite a contrast. So, so Victor, he, can mentioned, he mentioned about me to be uh, nervous. For could you imagine a oh. person that is dealing with? not only with the administrations, you know. The administration is, is, is I don't want the media here. I don't want, I don't want uh, uh, that you say anything about what's going on in the inside the prison system. Uh, you have all that uh, working in you, and then now you're gonna have an interview that is for beneficial of you. You're gonna tell them, so it's the opportunity to you to tell them, you know, this is what happened. This is what happened to me, okay? Not what happened to the Department of Correction, what happened to me, to Victor Rosario. This is the opportunity that I had. And now to say it in a, in a language that I had driven before in 1982, no understand? You know, that for me is, is, is an amazing thing to say. It's and amazing. to be with you right here, right now, is the same thing. I feel great. <laughs> <laughs> So when um, the story ran in the Globe, yeah. what was that like for you, Victor? Oh, my God. You, you give me some emotion in here. Uh, uh, I think the first time that I saw it, uh, I saw my face, there was a pity face. Mm -hmm. It was like a crying face uh, in the newspaper. It was ang you were a lot it, of anguish. Yes, it was like a... Uh, sadness and, 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 and I saw that in, in the newspaper. But the, the, the beauty was that cast doubt that was the title. Mm -hmm. And wow somebody 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 doing something right. Somebody is doing something right here, right now. Then to see the other the other inmates uh, inside, just to see it, and to see the impact that not only was doing to me, but doing to them also, okay? That now they started looking at me in a different way, because somebody, he said something <laughs> positive about myself. And, and, and it, it was an amazing thing to me to see it in that time. How much do you think that the reporting mattered in the, in, in the process of, of having Victor here tonight, Lisa? I mean, I think it made, it's, it's sort of hard to quantify. I think for starters that it framed how, um, you know, how the public was starting to view 
uh, what happened to Victor um, because it sort of opened this window a little bit into the idea that maybe the system had gotten it wrong. Um, I think it also had some practical benefits because um, several of the people who, um, the, the, the arson expert, for example, who was brought on board by, um, by the investigative journalism uh, effort um, ended up being a really wonderful witness at the hearing. So he initially had looked at the case um, not in a ton of depth, but enough to sort of be able to identify some of the things on the surface. But he was an amazing witness, Craig Byler, mm -hmm. at the hearing and really brought a different perspective to bear so that by the time we went to court and were, you know, I mean, the, the, the work of actually getting him out of prison required, you know, massive, uh, you know, effort to, to put all of this in writing, to write a motion, um, to put together affidavits from all of these different experts, um, and then to have a six-day evidentiary hearing in front of um, the judge who granted the motion. So all of these witnesses, every single one of them who had um, either talked to, to the journalists or who had provided affidavits, they all had to come into court and testify. Um, but I, I think another thing that the article did was it started to shape how even some of the experts in the Commonwealth's normal uh, arsenal uh, looked at the case. So many of the um, usual suspects, experts who the Commonwealth um, sought to work with in order to, to combat our very powerful evidence that this was a false confession, refused to work on the case because they had read or been exposed to all of the powerful evidence that was in that article um, talking about the elements of false confessions that, um, that were so clearly part of what happened to Victor. So that was interesting too, that in the end, the only person who would stand by the original uh, opinion that, um, that this confession was reliable was the original expert who testified 30, at that point 34 years earlier. Um, but it's an agonizingly slow process. With the story yeah. was 2010. 2010. Yeah. And when was the hearing finally? That we you filed our motion in 2012. Wow. Um, I got so. involved in 2011. Um, and then uh, we didn't have a hearing for another 18 months. Mm -hmm. So March of 2014, we had to wait another three and a half months uh, for the motion to be ruled on. And then luckily things sped up at that point and we, we yeah. were able to walk out uh, with him three days after the motion was allowed. So that was pretty awesome. So I have a question because uh, Lisa and I have also worked together on another case that she is, um, she's working on of a man named Darrell Jones who's been in jail for more than 30 years yeah. for a crime he maintains he doesn't commit. And he wanted to work with me on this case. And I think you were a little unsure about that, and it's interesting how you were saying, Dick, about how the, how the attorney gave you all this information, and it helps as a journalist, but I wonder as an attorney about sort of the, the sort of risks you take with that, and, and, and if you could talk at all about that. Can I answer that question? The only thing is that I'm not sure we can hear, everybody can hear you, but I would love to hear, we have a mic, maybe. So, I mean, yeah, I think. always. Uh, yeah. I think for me, maybe I mean, when we get the mic. I think for me that it is, um, it, yeah, to, to say that I was hesitant is an understatement. I was definitely anxious. Um, and in that, you know, with, with Mr. Jones's case, I wouldn't have initiated it if he hadn't. But that said, it w I mean, I, I think I might, you know, now look at the opportunities very differently um, because I learned a lot from the process of um, taking the risk with the client's participation um, of sharing information. And it, it just opened a whole set of doors I didn't expect it would open. Um, so, you know, one of the things that came out in the reporting on that case was conversations with, uh, with a juror who we would not have been allowed to talk to and who, but who came forward and, and really offered some powerful insights about what had happened in the jury deliberation room. So I think, you know, it is, it sort of rubs against everything that we're trained as defense lawyers about shielding our clients because, you know, I'm, I mean, I'm a public defender. I've, I, my job is to protect my clients and stand between them and the system. And so, um, and frankly, most reporting about pretrial cases is not favorable to the clients. And so to get over that hump and recognize this is something different, I have to have enough trust in my client and his truth to know that there's nothing to be afraid of. And whatever comes out 
if my client is innocent, then, um, then there's nothing bad that can come out of this journalism. Um, but that's a big hump to get over, and I think it's, it's something that, um, you know, I know that, um, that um, Andrea had many people cautioning her against uh, doing what she did. Um, and frankly, if she'd asked me back then, I probably would have said the same thing. Don't do that. That's crazy. Um, but boy, was it the right thing to do. Um, nice. Did you have, well, is this working? Yeah. Um, I said no about four or five times to Dick, no. And then he said, he gave me the name of two attorneys, and he said, call them. And um, one of them was Rosemary Scapiccio. On the drum gold case, yeah. Mm -hmm. And she said to me, if you believe your client is innocent, let him do the story. Interesting. And that's when I said, OK. So, so Victor. I know, again, because of the stories that I've done, how hard was it for you? I know you're excited to get that light on your case, but also to talk about your personal life. Was that, was that hard for you at all? Basically not, because when you are innocent, you don't have to have any type of fear for anything. Uh, you're an innocent person. The, the only thing you can speak is the truth. Not, you can, why, have, why you have to lie? You have to speak the truth. That's the only thing that are going to send you free. And because I believe that, I just, I just speak the truth and be me and be who I am. Uh, and this is what, what you see uh, uh, today. And when I spoke with him, I just spoke, I opened my heart just to let him know this is who I am. This is, this is what happened. Any question that he asked me, I spoke with so honesty and integrity. And, and, and be me, and, and, and I think that that's, that's, that's what he saw in me and I saw in him, that I can trust in him to do, write whatever he need to write. And I think that from that point, it was like an open sesame, you know? It was like an open window. Uh, you know, that's, that's what I think about, about, and I see that the, the, the case was more bright. It was like an open up because now the public can see. The public can see what really is going on. And uh, I just, just that, you know, it's, it's amazing. just excited to be here, I don't know. So, you know? so Lisa, you have these hundreds of letters. Do they come in envelopes to you from state prisons all over the? Yeah, yeah. People um, fill in applications and send letters asking for help every day. So, Stories like Victor's, and um, we also have Lawyer Johnson in the room who was exonerated in 1982 yes. after 10 years in state prison. I think he was the last person uh, convicted on um, death row before he was exonerated. He's here today. So thank you very much for coming. It just brings this question, and, I, and you probably know more than most of us. Oh, and we have Fred Clay here, who was just released from prison after 38 years in state prison. Another one. Amazing story. So the question is, how many more people are there? That's what keeps me up at night. I mean, I think when I think about how hard it is to, to you know, to, to to prove even one of these cases, how many years go into this, how many people have to be involved, it's sort of suffocating to think about, um, you know, the cases that I might not get to. Um, I mean, luckily, it's not just me operating in a vacuum. Um, we have a wonderful community of um, lawyers who are doing this work at the New England Innocence Project, at the BC Innocence Program. You know, I work with wonderful panel attorneys, um, but. Uh, I mean, it's a huge problem. I, you know, estimates are, you know, two and a half to five percent of people who are in prison are there for crimes they didn't commit, um, which is, you know, might sound like a small percentage, but it's a huge number of human beings who are in prison for things they didn't do. Um, and you know, there are the most painful decisions I have to make are the ones where, uh, you know, someone is applying for help and there's simply no way to prove that they're innocent. So I have to say no, um, and that's happened. Um, you know, so I think, I mean, I can't put numbers on it, but, you know, I know we have, I mean, we've had eight exonerations um, since we opened our doors. We've had 11 new trial motions granted, um, you know, uh, and, and I think there are many, many more people waiting. Great, great. 
So um, I just, I'm going to open it up to the audience after this one last question. Dick, I would just hope, hope you could tell us a little. You, you just wrote a book called Trell, which is based on the fictional story of Sean Drumgold. Right. And it's a young adult book. And I'm just wondering, why did you choose a young adult book? I, um, a couple things came together. Um, uh, and for those who aren't familiar with the Sean Drumgold Tiffany Moore case, I'll just quickly summarize it. Um, in the summer of 1988, uh, on Humboldt Ave, uh, Tiffany Moore was sitting on a blue mailbox with her friends. And there was a, a street gang beef un under, you know, that she was aware of. but. Um, some uh, gang members came up and started shooting at the kids on the corner there uh, and instead of, they shot and killed Tiffany Moore and she was only 11, 12 years old at the time um, and, and in 1988 she was the youngest victim of street gang violence in the city of Boston. Sadly there's been younger victims since. Uh, within a couple of weeks, uh, I mean the city was up in arms, uh, this was sort of height of crack cocaine and all that, it was a violent summer. Um, they arrested a young drug dealer named Sean Drumgold, and a year later, um, um, he was uh, convicted of murder and sentenced to life without parole in 1989. Um, I reinvestigated that case, uh, my last story at the Boston Globe in 2003, um, in which, much like Victor's case, wrote a story which raised questions and doubts about the, uh, the uh, Suffolk County DA's case against Drumgold. Um, compared to the agonizingly long process of, of Victor's case, that story triggered uh, uh, evidentiary hearings that very same summer of 2003. And frankly, by the fall, Sean Drumgold was home. And in large part because the district attorney's office, which had been fighting for years any efforts by Drumgold's attorney, Rosemary Scapiccio, to reopen the case. After hearing the evidence, Again, people who had been, we had, I had interviewed for my story and all that uh, in, in the court hearing, um, the, the DA's office actually joined the defense attorney in, in asking the judge to, in the interest of justice, to overturn Drumgold's conviction. So it happened in a, in a you know, comparatively speaking, you know, rapid fire pace. Um, I learned, uh, and my focus was journalistic, I learned during that, during that reporting that Drumgold, when he was arrested in 1988, he had a baby daughter, a uh, baby girl with his wife, um, and she had grown up with her, her father in prison. Um, and I learned that growing up, whenever she left prison, she would always say goodbye to her father and then say, Daddy, when are you coming home? Okay? That always stayed with me, and just a few years ago, um, and, you know, again, for a couple other reasons, and I had, wasn't working on another book, and I had some space, and that, that daughter's goodbye became the seed for uh, the novel that was inspired by this case. And um, I had written, you know, most all my work to date, till, until then, had been for an adult audience in the Boston Globe or in nonfiction books, uh, the themes being justice and injustice, things like that. And part of me wanted to say, well, I want to, you know, I want to bring these issues to a younger audience. So how do I do that? Well, what if the daughter, a fictional daughter, her name is Trell, what if she's the main character? You know, you start asking the what ifs. And what if she's like 13, 14 years old? All the legal appeals have been exhausted. Uh, the attorney throws up her arms and she says, all I can think of is, is if we can get a Boston Globe reporter interested in this, perhaps uncover something new and shed new light on this. So Trell then finds out or finds a reporter at the Globe, and the main action of the novel is how she partners up with a newspaper reporter to work the streets of Roxbury and Dorchester to uncover the evidence to show that her father was not the killer of this young girl years ago. Uh, so it becomes a story about not just justice and injustice for a younger audience, which I, you know, I, and part of this I think is because I teach now at BU in the college age, but still I like working around kids. And these are important themes. But also, and this is a big deal for you as well, the power of journalism. By having Trell team up with a journalist, and together um, they're like a spotlight team. Um, and, uh, and, and working journalistically um, to go back over the state's case and find the flaws in it. So, I, you know, that's, that's I'm circling great. in, no, but no, that's no, how that's, I came into fantastic. it. That's fantastic. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm looking forward to reading it. So, um, we definitely want to open it up to questions. Uh, there are mics, so if you raise your hand, 
Um, we would love to, we, this is being recorded, so please speak into the mic. And if you please um, give us questions uh, more than commentary. Um, I'm interested in hearing your, your sense of time, your experience from being incarcerated for over three decades. Has your relationship to time and the passage of time and how that feels being, you know, f free and out now compared to being incarcerated, and if there is something you can share well, from that experience. Well, well, the beginning at the beginning when I when I came out, uh, I confronted with so many things. Uh, one was the, the technology. Uh, the technology is, is is out of my hands. But uh, he created curiosity in me because uh, the time that I has been inside, my mind was only occupied in this uh, confinement. Uh, when I came out, it, it was for me looking, okay, I follow rules when I was inside. I have to follow rules when I outside. It's just coming from, from one small prison to a bigger prison. And, uh, and, and that was my mentality, is, is that. And I realized that I never left, never left uh, 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 the prison system, and I never left society. Uh, and, and I think that that was the one thing that helped me, me. The other thing was that I started inside the prison system, I started to build my life. I started from inside. I started to, uh, first of all, my faith, my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, from there, I, I just was the foundation uh, to uh, ordain my steps, that I have to ordain my steps. I have to start it from inside, not waiting for the time when I come out. I have to work in me. And to doing that, when I came out, I found that it was more people in prison outside than I was. And from that, I just started getting to adjust it, adjust it to society. Uh, the first thing that I had was a, a, a cell phone, and an and iPhone. He said, what is this? And I, and somebody called me, and, and I used it backward because uh, I think that there was a speaker, and the speaker no was there. It, it was a, a process to adjust. Uh, also, when I started to see the, the, the young people on the street, that caught me my attention. I said, well, in prison at least, they have a bed. What are they doing in the street? Homeless. I started seeing, and that started to make me sad, made me sad to see that, that all the changes that there has been, but it's still people on the street. And people inside the prison system, it's, it's not that I'm gonna uh, promote that the prison is the best thing to be. <laughs> but at least, you know, outside, I, I see people, even women, young women in the street, asking for money, begging for money. And for 32 years, I never see that before. So Victor, I, I forgot to ask you actually, when you were released, did they, did they give you any money or any help from the state? <laughs> I'm not gonna answer that. <laughs> I'm not gonna answer that because it's nothing, you know, it's still nothing. I just, like I said, I just beginning from inside, when I came out, I just having a, uh, I was ordained as a minister inside the prison system. And when I came out, I, I, I just having a work with the staff in Tremont Temple Baptist Church in downtown Boston, uh, and, and, and having my own office and all that. It, it was, it was like everything was for me, but that's not me that the other having the same bless that I had okay, or the same support that I had, that's not me that. It means that I am 
I think one of the blessed ones. So yeah, I had well, forgot actually to, one of the things, and then I get back, was to talk a little bit about the issue of restitution, because we have, um, we at the NECIR have done some stories on the restitution and the uh, long waits it takes to provide information or help to people who are r released from prison who are wrongfully convicted. And there's legislation right now in the state house, and maybe Lisa, you could talk a little bit about what's going on with that. Yeah, sure. And and actually, the answer to your question is no. Not a not a dollar has been given to him by the state. Um, he's been out for three and a half years, and um, and will undoubtedly have to fight for many more uh, before he has any hope of of being compensated. Um, and the same is true for every single one of our clients. Um, only one of the eight who's been exonerated has been compensated so far. Um, so yes, I mean we have there, the the legislation that was actually passed, um, inspired by Lord, Lawyer Johnson's experience of of having walked out of prison, walked out of death row with nothing, mm -hmm. um, inspired Senator Jalen back at the time the first law was passed to do something, um, to make you know create a path for people to be able to be compensated. And the problem is that um, you know all these years later, nearly 14 years after the passage of the law, um, we're, you know, there's uh, uh, people who, who are, are seeing the problems, which is that it takes so long to get compensated. Um, and you know, one of the attorneys who's done a lot of this work, Howard Friedman, is here and um, you know, can probably speak volumes to how challenging it is to, um, to get justice through that law. So when someone walks out of prison, I mean, I'm looking, um, looking at Fred Clay, um, you know, Fred went to prison at the age of 16, and he walked out at 53 with nothing, you know, with the $1,000 that had been saved in his prison canteen account, um, no family to welcome him home and offer him a place to live, um, and that's unacceptable. So the, um, the law that, that Senator Jalen is, is um, proposing, the reform that she's proposing, would address that in, at, in part, would provide some transitional support for people when they first get out, um, would provide with a much lesser showing um, access to initial resources. Um, you know, in Fred's case, we, we did a GoFundMe go um, because that was literally the only way to raise any money uh, so that he would be able to get on his feet and not immediately be obligated to have a job. Um, so I think you know the the, the it, it is the current status is that the um, the Senate passed a version of Senator Jalen's bill as an amendment to this big criminal justice bill that's now pending. The House um, declined to do so, but there is still hope in the conference. And I think that there's some really important changes that this law, if it's adopted, would. Um, would make that would that would at least create some way for people when they first walk out to have access to resources to just get on their feet. Great, thanks. But I um, think I think I think it's not it's not uh, I think there is not money in the whole world that can pay <laughs> they can pay thirty two years in prison or thirty eight years in prison uh, the pain and suffering that that the person go through, uh, the family go through, uh, I don't think they, anything can pay that. Yeah. So we have a question in the back. And that's you right there. Yep. I believe that lady was there before. Okay. Hi, <laughs> I'm Siona. I live in Dorchester and love the city, and I'm really happy to be here and listen to your story. Um, I was curious about the kind of work that you're doing with um, uh, on the lawyering side, on the legal side, and the defense side, uh, and how we can, how you think, either whether whether or not you're actually or your organization can pursue it. But what's the next step in terms of like? maybe some of the fake science around or the false science or the you know, arguments that are being made and how can we help that? I think it's probably greater than 5% that are in, in jail and falsely. Um, you, know, you only have to look at things like the Dukin case or the Farrakh case or anything like that where there's mass corruption um, and thousands, ten thousands of cases were thrown out um, in the last couple of years. So, um, 
can you speak to that? Um, how can we, you know, advocate? What what is next for people who don't have their, you know, um, that details in their minds? Yes, absolutely. So actually, it's you couldn't have asked a better question because the other um, the other thing that's happening in the legislature right now is um, an effort to establish a forensic science commission in Massachusetts, and that proposal was motivated by. Um, this recognition that we have, um, you know, I mean, one way to, to challenge flawed forensics is case by case by case, and that's what, um, it, you know, this is what it looks like, right? It, it takes 10 years. Um, another way to approach that problem is to have a commission that is charged with looking at every single case. So, you know, we know that Victor was convicted based on bad arson science. Let's look at every single other case from the 80s in particular um, where arson was a key component to the conviction. Um, so the Forensic Science Commission would be one way of doing that. Um, ironically, um, you know, uh, the, the Dick Lair referred to the, to the Cameron Todd Willingham case. Um, what prompted Texas to become the leader on this issue was the wrongful execution of Cameron Todd Willingham based on evidence that's almost identical to what was used to convict Victor. Um, and in fact, I remember that one of the more powerful moments that Victor and I shared was, was when he told me that, that you know, if, if he were in a state that had the death penalty, he would be dead, which is true. Um, and so I think um, you know, in Texas, they established this commission prompted by the horror of having gotten it so wrong. And they've done remarkable work. They've taken on a bunch of different areas of flawed forensics and really comprehensively examined cases and, and, you know, and made changes and you know, made recommendations that prevent wrongful convictions, but also done real work to correct, uh, to correct errors that have happened. So I think that's one important way that we could make a difference as a state. Great, great question. So. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my question's directed towards Lisa. Um, in regards to all of the trauma that's associated with people who are wrongly convicted, and in this case, being convicted for three decades, uh, does the city, state, or federal government have anything in place where uh, I guess we would have like a society redeployment program? Because usually people, they're really uh, interested in compensation. But like I said, there's a lot of trauma that's associated with this that none of us will ever experience. So is there any type of program to help people just be able to function in society? So that's a really good question. Um, and um, you know, the short answer is no. There isn't anything systemically that exists. Um, but you know, one of the things that actually um, has been kind of remarkable in developing organically um, since we've had um, you know, s several people who've been released over the past couple of years and have, have shared this experience is um, bringing them together and starting to form informal communities within Massachusetts. Um, you know, Victor, uh, I told him when I knew that Fred was getting out of prison, and he introduced Fred to, um, to, uh, to Louis Diaz, who is a reentry worker and has, has had done amazing work up in Lowell. And we've sort of basically been trying to form informally ways of supporting one another. Um, and that, uh, I, I think, there, there isn't any way other than that that I know of currently um, to, to, to put those communities together. Um, at the national level, one of the things that, um, that happens is that every year uh, there's a conference and all of the innocence organizations from around the country come together. Um, and it is, um, it is a conference that's not just for lawyers, it's also for exonerees and family members of exonerees. And Victor and Beverly have gone for several years. I'm hoping to bring Fred this year. Um, but it's a way to bring people together and recognize this is a common horror that we've shared. And we can support each other. We can empower one another. Uh, but there's so much more that needs to happen. And I do think another piece of what Senator Jalen's proposals would do is to give access early on to, to other forms of transitional services. Um, but the reality is I, I, don't, I, I don't know who is equipped to help um, you know, with, with what we've done to people when we send them to prison for so long. Um, I, I think that it's, it's a trauma that we all have to take responsibility for and help um, heal. 
Um, and you know, in some ways, I feel like these conversations where Victor has a chance to share his experience with people, um, where Fred has a chance to, to talk, and where people can see this has happened to me, um, that, that every time that happens is part of the healing process, too. That is a big, big missing piece, I mean, in, in a big way. I do know that um, in, in New York, where the Innocence Project, I think, first began, Barry Sheck, um, back in the 80s and 90s, again, using DNA um, uh, and um, succeeding in, in overturning cases around the country. In the early 2000s, after they had, um, and I don't have the data, the numbers, but after they had succeeded in, in maybe 80, 90, or 100 exonerees by the early 2000s, they realized that there's a reentry issue as well. And they, they established a program called Life After Exoneration in which they were trying to de develop these kind of support services for their clients. Because again, once the TV lights went off and once the legal papers were done, it's like, have a good life, you know? Um, and I'm, I haven't followed that program, but, but I do know that they certainly recognized um, that there's a big need for the, the next big step. Well, and actually, Victor's, you know, Victor and Beverly, one of the things that they've done through Connect to Freedom, a component that's sort of still developing is to have um, to create space for people to come together and talk about shared trauma. And I think that's, um, you know, I mean, the, a challenge is just that everybody's living in different places and it's, you know, it's challenging just the logistics of getting, bringing people together. But every time it happens, it's so powerful and important. And there's so much more that we could be doing um, to, to support that component of, of reentry. Great. Thank you. You don't want to hear. Uh, hi. Um. Thank you all for having this um, conference, and my heart goes out to everyone that had to spend their life in prison. My name is Grace, and I'm here today because um, my daughter, Candace, uh, she was arrested on August 29th in 2014. She suffered a mental health decline. She was working. She assaulted someone in the uh, MBTA station in Cambridge, and she's been arrested. She's been uh, held uh, for three plus years. Um, uh, her court appointed attorney has not filed a motion for bail, never filed a motion for a speedy trial, never filed a motion to dismiss the case. Um, since then, she um, was uh, sexually assaulted at MCI Framingham. Uh, she suffers from a mental health disability. She has been held for over three years without bail and without a speedy trial. Her attorney has waived her right to a speedy trial and a jury trial. A recent psychologist, psychological evaluation concluded that Candace should be released to a DMH shelter. The judge has now ruled that Candace was not competent at the time of the incident on August 29, 2014. The attorney has provided no defense against the DA's plan to commit Candace indefinitely. The attorney refused so, to file a motion me, for bail in a speedy trial. I am so, so sorry to hear so, about all of this. Yeah. Do you have a question to ask our panelists? Well, well my question is, is that um, the current um, bills or, uh, that's being filed to rectify this problem has failed to r rectify the, the real problem that I heard that Victor Rosario had and my daughter had and probably everyone else had, is that the court appointed attorney is not doing their jobs. They're not filing the motions. They're not defending. And so my daughter, the first one she had, she dismissed the lawyer. And then after that, uh, when you dismiss a lawyer, then they hold it against you. And they don't do anything. So the problem is that the, the court-appointed attorney is not doing their, they're not defending the client. So That's do you have a, the problem. Do you have a question for our so panelists? My, 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 my question is, is that what are we going to do about the court-appointed attorney system? Because that system needs to be changed. So I'm happy to talk to you offline about the issues that you're raising, because they sound like issues that are probably better talked about privately. I think it's really I think it's really complicated to 
um, to, you know, <laughs> the public, Massachusetts Public Defender's Office is one of the best public defender's offices in the country. Um, it also is one of the least well-funded uh, public defender's offices in the country. And um, there are some of the most extraordinary lawyers I know um, who, who are fighting in court every day and fighting extraordinary battles on behalf of clients. And then there are lawyers who don't do that work. Um, and you know, the public defender's office does a lot of work to try to make sure that people have lawyers who care about them, who see them for, their, for who they are, and who are giving them individualized attention. Um, you know, when somebody has mental health issues, that can create a whole other set of challenges, and it sounds like um, your daughter is facing those in a very profound and, and tragic way. Um, but I think that, you know, it's, it's hard to, um, to answer the question you're asking without knowing a whole lot more about her case and in a context where I think, you know, I, I think it's just, um, it's hard to answer it in the general. Um, but it certainly sounds like your, your daughter's up against uh, a very difficult situation. So, and also just as, as a journalist, feel free to reach out to me, who knows, you know, we're always interested in stories also, mm -hmm. so that's... Okay, so... Um, Clearly, we're here because the criminal justice system has failed many people along the way. So um, your story is important, and I, I, I hope you talk to to people here in this room to, to work through that. And, and um, one of the reasons that the Public Defender's Office established an innocence program in 2010 was out of a recognition that we do get it wrong and that lawyers bear a responsibility for that, too. Um, so I think it's really important that every single player in the system recognize the role that we sometimes play in contributing to injustice. So we have a question here? Where? Okay. Um, it's really important to, for the journalists to you know, air the stories out and to shed light on uh, unlawful conviction. Um, how difficult it, is it in the current sort of instant media um, when that is sort of out in the open and then how much resistance do you get from people after that like w what does the the media play after that piece is out there in getting somebody freed the question is to me I think the question is for you do you want to talk a little sure, bit about sure but you're more in the game I right. <laughs> but um, um, I mean, I've, in my work at the Globe and even since, I think uh, the Globe still has its spotlight team. I think the Globe, despite its diminishing resources that we can, um, and its shrinking size you, you can see every day, still has a really strong commitment to public service journalism, of which this is a public service, that, you know, wrongful convictions and whatnot. Um, I found the Globe, and then and, uh, to be really supportive, uh, you know, if, if they get behind a story, to continue to do the follow-ups and hopefully put the pressure uh, on the judiciary and the other you know, branches of government to, to respond to it and, and whatnot. But even as a place like the globe shrinks, the, I think some of the good news is that a place like NECIR rises. These nonprofit standalone investigative units um, are really important, uh, again, on these kinds of issues that require the, um, you know, a, a long attention span. It's not a quick hit as we yeah. say in the business. These are deep dives. These take times. You have to have the commitment and the resources. And it is harder to find them in traditional you know, media. But um, you know, again, foundation funded or university affiliated or public you know, broadcasting affiliated um, specialized units. Um, NECR is one, but it, they're, not, they're not unique. There are these kinds of units around the country. Well, so they you. become the go-to places. Thanks very much for giving us the, um, I mean, definitely, I mean, one of the projects that I'm uh, very proud of that I've been here at NECIR was a project actually of one of Lisa's clients, Darrell Jones, and we started that. Basically, the, um, his wife reached out to me and asked me to come meet him in, in state prison, and when I started hearing his case, I wanted to tell his story, and we spent... Uh, a semester at BU also with my students looking at his case and then following it for another six months with WBUR. And um, it, was a, it was a 
it was an important story because we were able to um, look at all the ways that it raised questions in the same way Victor's did about whether this man had a, had a uh, just trial. And there's a lot of questions about it. So definitely um, being a journalist is one of, uh, one of those sort of humbling and powerful experiences that you can write stories. And we were given support to write that story. And we followed it up as the case is now um, being considered by a judge. But these cases are, it's true, one by one. And it takes a lot of time. Investigative journalism is hard, hard work. And it takes a lot of time and resources. So. Um, you know, as much support as everybody in this world that we're living in, uh, it's, it's, it's an important part of supporting and also a great reason you're all here. So we appreciate that and that question. Um, yes. Hello, hello. OK. Could you uh, expound? OK, oh, I got you. OK. Could you uh, expound a little bit more on the evidence that they had on you in terms of your case? Because during the presentation, I didn't hear too much on the evidence. So I was wondering, can you really explain a little bit more in terms of you know, how much or how little was the evidence that convicted you in your court mm -hmm. case? I think it was a piece of paper that I signed. OK. Uh, not knowing the contents of that piece of paper, what they call confessions, even then I never confessed. But just because they signed to sign something, then I, I think from that everything started. I think that that was the foundation. I think that that was the fabrication. I think I want to continue. Uh, uh, I think that that's, that's the, 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 the base of, of the whole entire case. We have room for one more question, I guess, or maybe two for a few. We've got some more hands up. How about the, the um, enthusiastic hand right hello. there in the middle? Hi. Hello. Um, good oh. evening. Oh, I'm sorry. I have a hard. Okay. I'm right you here. first. Sorry. Okay. A couple more questions then. Okay. Um, this is a question for Lisa or anybody on the stage, the journalist as well. Um, just being here today and um, seeing all of it, uh, you talking about the cases that you help um, exonerate, um, the elephant in the room is kind of the race of the people that are involved in the cases. And I was wondering, how does your program address that um, discrepancy um, with race and ethnicity and um, the language barriers and things along that, those lines? It's a really good question. And you know, I think that, um, I mean, it is absolutely the case that wrongful convictions have a profoundly disproportionate impact um, on people of color. Um, and that is as true in Massachusetts as it is anywhere else in the country. Um, you know, one of the things that defense lawyers are just starting to figure out how to do, and that really many parts of the criminal justice system are only just starting to figure out how to do, is how to collect accurate data and information so that we can learn from it and, and really um, look at it um, honestly. And um, so you know, one of the questions that, um, that we struggle with um, and that I've struggled with is, um, you know, I guess in some ways more about language and also reading comprehension. Um, but uh, how do we make the questions we're asking people to answer about their cases um, questions that people can um, can meaningfully answer? Um, how do we deal with language barriers in the application process itself? How do we even make sure we're reaching the, the you know, everyone who needs to be reached in the prison system? Um, I think that there is a way in which when people see, uh, when people in prison see the faces of the people who are being exonerated, that that is inspiring. And um, you know, the faces of the people that we have exonerated are very diverse. Um, and I think that that, um, you know, I, I hope that that's some indication that we are um, at least reaching um, the right people. But um, I, you know, I have, I have a lot of worries um, about that. I, I worry about people who are incarcerated and have mental illness and who can't be advocates for themselves. I'm very aware of the fact that the people we, uh, many of the, the people who we've ended up getting involved with are people who are also really good advocates for themselves. Um, and that worries me because I think there are, there are certainly 
um, you know, people who are quietly serving time for, for crimes they didn't commit, um, and that really worries me. Um, but I think that, um, you know, I think that the, the more information we collect about the race of the people who are being wrongfully convicted, the, um, the ethnicity, the language barriers, um, that all of that is information we need to, to use to try to get better. Um, and one of the things I'm kind of hoping to do now that it's been uh, seven years since our program first started is to take kind of a, um, a backward look at what, you know, what are the cases that, that, that have succeeded, which are the cases we have um, said no to, to, to take an honest look at what we're doing and whether we're, um, you know, whether we're reaching um, the, the right people. That's a good question. Yeah. Um, okay, where is, where is the mic? I get, okay. I don't know, can you hear me? Okay. Um, my question was um, about having translators. I understood that in the courts you would have translators when you would have people testifying if they could not speak the language. Is there um, a law requiring translators for people who are initially arrested? In Massachusetts, if, if someone does not speak English, yes. The court, the, um, the court has to um, have an interpreter present. Um, and there is an established Office of Court Interpreters that um, provides uh, language services and translation. Um, actually, when Victor, when we had the evidentiary hearing in Victor's case, even though he is now fluent um, in conversational English, we decided after talking to him that we wanted to have an interpreter there for the um, hearing because so much of what was happening in the hearing was highly. Necessarily back in the police station. I'm referring to in the police station. Yeah. Oh, 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 right. Well, oh, sorry. Okay. I, I misunderstood you. I thought you were asking about in the at, at arraignment. So, I mean, I think that the way that police departments handle that um, varies. They are supposed to use official court interpreters. However, there are definitely situations where police departments will rely on, um, you know, in a, for example, in a Spanish-speaking interview, they'll rely on a police officer who speaks Spanish. Um, there's a lot of problems that <laughs> that I think anyone who, who is bilingual um, would recognize um, with that system. Um, and sometimes we find ourselves in a situation of having to do an independent translation of uh, an interrogation to see whether the interpreter is actually interpreting the questions accurately. I think I, I, was going to say, I think that there can be bias involved, that there can be bias involved when you have a police officer who speaks the language that is mm -hmm. necessarily being interpreted. But I think that one of the things that I knew in a, about in a hospital is that you have on-call interpreters on the phone who are independent, and so they get the medical information that they need from these interpreters, and maybe it's important to have a slew of these interpreters available um, on-call for situations <coughs> where the, uh, the people who are arrested don't have a language and that are who would be independent Interpreters. Is it? Is it? Can I? Okay, last. Is it? Is it different between between interpreter and translator? It's completely different. But I think uh, you need. Then maybe you need both. But you need a translator. I know that they have the translators, and maybe I misspoke when I said interpreter. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to um, I'm going to stop this here. But I have to say, anyone who does have questions and good ideas and things, we are. Uh, a journalist shop, and I would love to um, hear story ideas. I've, I've done a story about the lack of court interpreters, etc. And um, we uh, we want to leave a little time now. We have a half an hour left to have a nice reception outside where you can talk to the panelists and talk to the, some of the people here. And um, please, uh, my information and my card is out there for story ideas. And um, Jennifer, is there time for Fred to ask? Fred his has a question. Yes, one last question right. for Fred. I think he deserves it. <laughs> I think so. Too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know if we have a mic. You could just stand up and. I, I know we uh, early talked about the uh, identification part, and I know that you mentioned also there's some been some some uh, issues concerning uh, Victor's uh, scientific evidence with the fire. I know in my case there was some scientific evidence in the hypnosis, mm -hmm. but that wasn't the, the main issue. But my main issue is just, can you speak a little bit more about the, the identification part? Because that was the part that really got me convicted in a way, and how 
unreliable it is right now as it was back then, but it was still allowed into court? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when I, you know, when I mentioned, um, you know, kind of the red flags, the things that we're most worried about, um, you know, eyewitnesses coming into court and, um, you know, pointing the finger at someone and saying that's the person I saw is just about the most powerful evidence that you can imagine. Um, there's sort of no more, um, you know, horrifying, well, depending on how you look at it, but from the defense side, horrifying moment um, in a trial than that. Um, and so, you know, knowing that in 75% of DNA exonerations involve um, at least one, if not multiple, eyewitnesses getting it wrong. Um, you know, some combination of the things that uh, affect how people perceive events accurately and whether they're able to, um, to, to, to be, you know, accurate reporters of what they saw and then the way that the police handle uh, the eyewitness um, uh, sort of questioning and the, the photo, the identification procedures themselves. Um, you know, we've done a lot in Massachusetts to make things better, but we have so much more to learn. And I think that, um, you know, the, the cases, I mean, Fred, your case is a particularly stark example. The eyewitnesses were actually hypnotized and told <laughs> that they would be able to re-watch the events as though they were watching a television program. Um, it's kind of hard to imagine. That wouldn't happen today, but a lot of the other things that happened um, in the eyewitness uh, interactions might. Um, and I think it's really important that we not just say, oh, these things are all problems in the past and they don't happen anymore, that we have to be vigilant in every single case and never let uh, evidence get before a jury that is based on the kinds of flawed identification procedures that occurred um, in your case. Well, thank you. That's a great way to end it. We appreciate everybody. Thank you so much, Lisa, Victor, Dick, for coming. And uh, look forward to talking to you now for a bit. Thank you.